Okay, so I will start first with a story because I think you have had lunch and now you deserve a good nap. So I will tell you a story and I hope you don't fall asleep. So this is my story four years ago when I was working in a company that has been around for maybe six, seven years by then. We were native in the cloud and I was working in a product similar to Netflix, but we were doing cartoons. And we were not monetizing by subscriptions, we were monetizing by ads. So when you monetize by ads, every cent is critical for your application. So I was working in that project for two years and with the time was passing, we were getting more and more complaints from our management, our execution, our operations were too expensive. And it was a Java application, so the first thing we did, we add more caching and we make it performant and we didn't know what we were doing really because we didn't understand cloud economics. So we improved the application and make it better, but it really didn't help much. In some point, we got an ultimatum from our management that if we don't reduce the cost of our application, they will cancel us. And we start getting worried. We love our team, we love our project. So we were like, well, we need to do something about this. So what we did, we start thinking on ways to uh, refactor the application. First, we asked the questions, why you mean by expensive? Because being expensive is a very generic thing. So we learned basically two things. First, transferring things from our data centers to the customers were very expensive. The traffic of images, the traffic of metadata, the video, we were doing it right. We were using some kind of uh, CDN, but the rest, we were just doing it straight from our data centers. And then the other part is that we were using a lot of legacy services inside our company. Our company was native cloud, but it was built in a time where clouds didn't have more than instances and a few services. So a lot of things were built from scratch. And later on with time, they were removed and migrated to something else, and we didn't follow. So we had a lot of technical devs, and we have free developers. So this story is about how we migrate to serverless. I went to my boss and I told, I think serverless is the right solution. How many times you have said that to your boss? I, we need to go to containers, it's the coolest thing. I've been tinkering around at home and I deployed like a Docker, it works. I was the same with serverless. I have done four Lambda functions, they are the best, they scale, they follow all these amazing things, let's do it. I did the same with functional programming and TDD and things like that, I'm, I'm that type of person. Very annoying. Uh, and yeah, so my boss says, well, whatever, if you want to migrate to serverless, that's the solution, then go for it. So this presentation, I want to take you through our migration experience. This will go through our failures because we fail a lot and very badly. And it will also take you to the success because I've been working in serverless for the four, last four years. Serverless as a concept has five years, so I'm quite been there from the beginning and I have migrated other successful applications in the meantime and I also have worked with other people that have migrated successful applications. I have read many books about this. So this is a collection of all my knowledge that I want to share with you in maybe 50 something minutes. I'm Latino so time is not my skill. So first, I want to present myself. I'm Marcia. I work at AWS for the last five months as a developer advocate for the Nordic. So you will see my pretty face a lot around. Uh, I'm also the host of a YouTube channel called FUBAR. I post videos there. I've been doing this for three years and a half, posting videos every week about serverless and the cloud. And I've been coding since I have a memory, so very, very sad life, you know. Who needs hobbies and go for exercising when you can sit in your computer? So let's start with the fun part of this conference, that is the definitions, yay! Let's start with defining what is a monolith. No, I will not do that. I will just mention <laughs> one important thing that uh, I think it's important to understand the whole presentation, that is monolith is the natural way of building systems. I, this project that I was working on, we started with microservices. We had the mind to build something nice and small that do one thing and one thing only. Features start adding up there because we were too lazy. And finally, we have a nice, tidy, small monolith that I think you have all seen. The problem with monolith is two problems, its scale and its complexity. So the more bigger it becomes, then you have that 20% of your application that is receiving 80% of the traffic and you need to scale it all. And whenever you want to deploy something new, you're just like, oh man, it takes me like three days to get something out. It's not very practical. The ideal word is a microservice. There we know one small piece that is replaceable and independent deployment. And I like this definition from Sam Newman that he says that it can be rewritten in two weeks. 
I like that, and I think that's something we need to think about when we are building microservices that are able to be replaced in two weeks. Because then we don't feel attached to our microservices. We can build something that solves the problem today. We don't need to over-engineer it. We can work about it later. Like evolutionary architecture, we solve a problem today, and then we do some kind of tests to make sure that this application keeps on working properly. Now let's go to the core of this. That is something I will spend a little bit more time because you might not know about it, and it's serverless. Serverless is not a technology, it's a mindset, it's a methodology. It's more closer to DevOps than to uh, containers in that way. The idea is to maximize the value, but minimizing the undifferentiated heavy lifting. This guy, Jeremy Daly, has a great newsletter, so if you want to follow him, he's good about serverless, you will learn a lot about that. But that means not to rewrite the wheel, not to spend time working, even if you're in the cloud, setting up your instance types, thinking about how many CPUs, how much memory, how much, what kind of hard drive, and things like that. That's heavy lifting that doesn't produce any value. You have to focus on what really brings value to you. In my experience, I have built four authentication services. Four, they do more or less the same thing. That's heavy lifting for something that doesn't produce any value. You can go and get an now zero and do some modifications, and that's kind of it. But I made one, it was successful, then they put me to make more, why not? So I like this tweet from another of our serverless influencers, Jared, that he says that if the platform has it, use it. Sometimes platforms don't have 100% of the things you need, but with 80%, you will cover most of the use cases, and you will save a lot of headaches. If the market has it, buy it, if so, if the platform doesn't provide it, and then, you might reconsider your requirements. Are those the really the things that are important, what you need? And then if you build it, own it. So for a component to be serverless, it needs to go for four promises. The first one is that it scales automatically. You don't have to worry about scale. It goes up and down, and things work. Sure, you have to know the limits of your services, the, the components that you're using, because nothing is unicorns and rainbows. There is always limits. We don't live in a magical world. But in general, those limits are flexible. The second thing is that you pay for how much you use. That's something basic for the cloud. So if you've been running in the cloud, you know that your bill is that your electricity bill. You pay at the end of the month how much you've been using. There is no infrastructure to manage, so that's very different from when you're doing instances in the cloud or virtual machines in the cloud that you need to set up a lot of configuration that is very close to the real hardware. And then the last thing is the high availability built-in. When you are even working in the cloud, if you are deciding on an instance, you need to say in which data center you want to deploy that instance. And that's kind of tightening you. If that data center for any reason goes down, then your screw up, so you need to think about how I will make high available applications when you're using serverless components that can build in, in the application. So for defining serverless, I will tell you that it comes in two flavors. The first one is functions as a service. The other one is managed service or backend as a service. For the function as a service, I use the definition of Lambda. That was the first thing that came to the market, and after that, people start using the word serverless. There were similar things out there, but this was, was the one that made the boom. So if you see these first two paragraphs, they are very, very, very similar to what I mentioned about the promises. Lambda lets you run code. That's what it does. Without provisioning service or manning, managing any infrastructure. You run and you scale and you do all the unicorns and magic. And the critical thing, the very different thing from Lambda from anything else, that is an event-driven application. So you need to trigger those functions in a way. It's just not running all the time. So you code your function, you deploy it, and there is some events. It can be a row in a database change, a new file was uploaded to storage, a new user clicks somewhere, an HTTP request come in, and that will trigger a Lambda function. The Lambda function is idle until somebody doesn't trigger it, so you're only paying when that Lambda function is executing. Lambda will do whatever. It will call other AWS services, other HTTP endpoints, compute something, whatever, and then it will go to sleep again. And that's the nice thing of Lambda. It's totally event-driven, and it's, you pay in an, uh, as you go, so you don't need to worry about that. You can use Lambda with basically whatever language you like. So if it's not listed in the main list, you can bring your own custom runtime, so feel free to do that. Then the other part, the other flavor of serverless is the managed 
services, that's how we call it in AWS, backend as a service in the serverless slang. And that's basically something that we have been doing for ages if you're working with the cloud. The first service that was uh, built in the cloud were S3 and SQS. One is the queue service, the other one is a storage service. There is a debate which one was first, but those were the two first cloud services that were announced. And those are very serverless -y services. So they are basically third-party cloud-hosted applications that can be used in your applications with nobody else noticing. So if you're storing your web pages in S3, your customers don't know where you're storing it. If you're using some Auth0 for your authentication, your customers don't care. It just works very, very tight with your application. There is many building blocks. And this talk, I will focus a lot on the AWS building blocks, but don't worry. This is available in all the clouds. So it's not something if you are using Google or Azure or IBM, you will not find similar building blocks in those clouds. I just like to bring this to some, some titles that you can go and try it at home later. So this is very generic talk in that way. So we were in our, yes, my manager said like, yes, do whatever. My manager was very interested in things, like you can see. And, and I was like, well, but we have a problem. We don't know anything about serverless. Uh, we were a backend team of free Java developers, and we know very little of the cloud. So what we can do, we really address our lack of knowledge. Uh, and my manager said, well, we can, by that time, it was three years, four years ago, there was no blog post, there was no YouTube channels, there was no courses in a cloud guru or anywhere about serverless. So what we did, we hired a consultant that was coming four hours a week to our project to work with us. It was at the beginning a kind of classroom-based thing, like this is serverless, this is how you deploy a Lambda, and it was like that. But by the six months that we did this, it became a super interesting thing because we were building, we were migrating our project, and we were having real problems. And this guy that had a lot of experience in the cloud was able to help us, and he was learning a lot from our use case because by that time, we have six billion views in this application. It was not a tiny application. It was quite big. So it was a very interesting use case for everybody. And if you're migrating today, please, to whatever you're migrating, train your developers. Because even if your architect is the expert, if the guys that are going to do the job don't know what they're doing, it will be a pain. And it's proven that companies that have an education plan in place, migrate five times faster than companies that don't have it, and adopt the cloud way faster as well. The other question that we have was, is this going to solve our problem? And I think this is a very important question to have, because as developers, we get a lot of excitement when we see a new technology. We want to migrate everything all the time, because it sounds so cool, it sounds so promising. But sometimes we need to stop and think, will this solve our problem? And to know that, what we did was to create a lot of minimal bio products, MVPs. We listed our problems into the detail of what the problem was, like, well, we needed to transport this JSON to our customers, and this JSON has this blah, 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 how we can do it. We did it in multiple ways, with the technology we wanted, with the technology that we had, and we try, and we try, and we try, until we find a good way to solve the problem. This good way, could be improved later because things change, we learn new things, but it was a great way to validate our hypothesis. And with this, we built around eight MVPs for each of the problems we have, the legacy services that we want to change, the databases we want to change, the transfer of metadata and images. And with this, now we had two things. First, a validation that we can focus on this technology and this technology will help us to migrate, and second, some experience, because by that time, I only have deployed four lambdas. So it was time to get some experience. And these MVPs really help, because there is no production, there is no much legacy stuff, it's all brand new. So now we are ready to start our foundational work. And this is super important when you're doing anything, is to have a solid base to work on. So the first thing you have to think is your organization structure. I don't know if you have heard about Conway Law, but it's very common that they say that usually uh, the software replicates the organization communication structure. So that's something we have, we have seen, and you can check it in your own organization, how your software is 
and you will see the different communication patterns. So we have a tiny monolith, so basically that's what it was. So what we did is the reverse Conway maneuver. We distributed our soft in a way that we wanted our software to be, our ideal way. And that kind of helped us to understand who was responsible for what and how we should do the thing. In bigger teams, it's always good to have smaller agile teams, divide your people into smaller groups, so there is the less communication overhead, there is more agility, and in Amazon we have this concept of the two pizza teams. Teams that are smaller than what two family pizzas can feed you, so if you have hungry developers like me, then maybe you need less developers. But it's around 12, 14, 15, depending on how, how hungry they are. The next thing you need to do is to pick your tools. And here is where you start deciding. Are we doing monorepo? Are we doing multiple repos? Are we picking all the different programming languages just because we like them, or are we keeping on one? Are we using this developer framework, or are we using this? You need to do a little bit of research and understand the different tools and get why you want to pick that tool. Just don't pick it because the architect likes it. That's not very smart, and we tend to do that quite a lot. The other thing you need to do in your foundational work is to pick your infrastructure as code. If you're building applications in the cloud, if you're building distributed systems, and if you're building serverless, that is the other two things, you need to have infrastructure as code. When you're building serverless applications, you will have a lot of components. Functions as a service, managed as a services, everything will be around and it will be very, very messy. So you need to have infrastructure as code to minimize the risk and to avoid a lot of bugs by going to console and clicking. So the good thing of infrastructure as code, if you don't know, it makes your code repeatable and all your changes predictable. And you can have the same environment in development, in staging, and in production. And as a serverless infrastructure, only you pay as much as you use, you can have development, and if nobody's using it, it doesn't cost you anything. So there is not a lot of kind of problems of building a lot of environments. In my experience, we have built environments for each of the developers. So development was very specific for the developers, and then staging was like a common environment for everybody where everybody can test. So you can have as multiple as you like. If you're using AWS, the base of all um, Infrastructure as code is cloud formation. You can use that service. Other clouds have different. And everything will uh, come in a stack of resources all together that you can update, delete, or create all together. You have to define your infrastructure as code as a YAML or a JSON, or you can use CDK, that is the cloud uh, development kit that will allow you to write your infrastructure as Java or TypeScript or Python. So, you have multiple flavors. If you're doing serverless-specific development, I recommend you to use a serverless framework or uh, AWS SAM that is that little square there. If you want to write infrastructure with SAM, it looks like this. This is HTML, 20 lines of code, and you will have a Lambda function. You have a role giving permissions to that function to put things in the database. You will have an API gateway. That means an endpoint to trigger that function with a path and a method. And you will have a database, a DynamoDB table, everything in 20 lines of code that you can deploy in the cloud into as many environments as you want, as many accounts as you want, and it will scale magically. So that's the power of infrastructure as code. I'm very lazy, so what I did in my migration project, I created templates with all the basics, and people then were changing just a couple of names, and they were having infrastructure pretty simple. So creating templating and, and creating when you're using infrastructure as code is pretty uh, easy way to get everybody started, so not everybody needs to write these files from scratch. The other thing you need to do is to have a good CI CD pipeline, but if you're building microservices, you know that, and you might have one. You can use that one with serverless. You don't need to use any of these tools. The important thing is that you have one. This is just using a code pipeline and different AWS tools, but you don't these are not the important thing. It's the important thing is that you have your pipeline that you can deploy, build, test, and deploy into multiple stages without any human intervention. That somebody checks code in the repository and phew, magically appears in production. Well, maybe with something in the middle like testing and things like that, but it just happens. So you don't need to depend on, on, on a lot of manual work. And the last part of your foundational work is monitoring and observability. 
you need to think about this from the day zero that you're starting a serverless application. How you're going to monitor those components. Serverless components tend to be like herding cats. They will do whatever they want, whenever they want. They are event-driven. They have their life of their own. So you need to have a good place to monitor and understand that. By default, all the resources, all the AWS services will send metrics and logs to CloudWatch. So if you are using those, you already have that done by default. There is this concept of tracing, so you can trace the life of an event through all the different hoops and loops, all the different services that it goes through. And for that, you need to enable that. That's done with X-Ray. There is many third-party services that do serverless monitoring. If they are built on AWS, they will be using CloudWatch and X-Ray for default, and then they will be improving the metrics. So that's kind of the core observability part. And you need to have it in place, because it will happen that when you deploy and you start having production things, you will not know what is wrong, because debugging in the distributed systems and debugging in serverless applications is very, very hard. So you cannot count on that. Now let's go to the core of this, <laughs> this presentation, that is the migration strategies. I have found three that are quite relevant. The first one is the one with it, the big rewrite, the most exciting one, zero experience of migrating anything. I go there with my team and we start coding like crazy. The first month, it was so exciting. We were getting code out, but we were not deploying it anywhere. We're just going to staging and that's it. After six, seven months of writing code, we were very demotivated. And we finish most of the migration, and we put it into production. Yeah, it exploded in our face. We spent many weeks without sleeping. Like, we were testing our foundational work on the day that we went to production with the whole big bang. You imagine how that went very, very wrong. So please, don't do it. If you do it this, you are First, demotivating all your employees because they will not see any benefit. You're testing your foundational work, all the things that you did seven months after you deploy. You will be putting into production things that you have built like six months ago in the case that it takes you six months to migrate. And then your application that you're migrating is changing all the time. Maybe new features are added, so your scope is creeping all the time. It's growing and you're like trying to catch up. Don't do this. The other option is the monolithic function, and there is many uh, cases in the internet of very successful applications that are the monolithic function. What that means, grab your monolith and put it inside Lambda. Yay. This is a, this is a great way to start your migration if your application is not in the cloud yet, so if you, or it's in another cloud provider. Put it in a function and then start migrating from there. For, because for the long migration process I will show you, you will need to have your application in the cloud already. So if your monolith is too big, you can use something like serverless containers, like Fargate or other clouds have other flavors. And that will also help you. So if you are using Node.js, this is a good uh, links that will help you to migrate your express service into a big, big function. A fat function, as we call it, for Java, that's uh, the one. And that's available for multiple uh, frameworks, so you can find if your framework is supported by these tools. So this is a very simple way to migrate your application to the cloud. The pattern I want to spend time is the strangler pattern. Maybe you have heard about it, but it's basically going from a monolith and start deploying services into production and taking out pieces in a controlled way until you end up with a very tiny monolith or then with a fully migrated microservices. You will also need to break the database, and I think that's one of the hardest part of the whole process. So let's go through the strangle pattern in five steps. So how these steps work, step one and two are like basic work that you need to do. Step three, four, and five is to migrate one service out. And then if you want to migrate another one, you go three, four, five again. So this is our project I will start uh, showing you. This is our application that will guide us through because I was thinking to put my video application, but it was such a mess that I will need to explain a lot of things. So this is an example that we all have seen a small little monolith managing customer order and inventory. This is nothing rocket scientist. -y. We have one repository layer, like always, and then one layer, in this case, for authentication and user management. But there can be other layers as well that go through the whole application. 
And then we have an SQL database with five tables or more, it doesn't matter. The first step you need to do is to find the seams of the code. And this, if you're a tidy programmer, you might already have a good tidy monolith where everything is in nice packages. But if you're not a tidy programmer, maybe it's time to find the seams of the code and put everything inside little packages. And there is where you need to find your bounded context. That in monolith, it happens that it's if it's more if, if you do it like we did, that we had a microservice that creeped out into my, a monolith, then that might not be really tidy because you don't want to, at the beginning, show that you're adding functionality that doesn't belong, so you're cheating yourself. You know how you do technical dev, sometimes you're very sneaky. So for Java, in general, you put things in packages. It's quite easy because it's a strongly typed language. For JavaScript, if you don't have a good unit test and you start moving things around, things will start breaking. So put unit tests. So by the end of this step, your application should look something like this, free packages or free modules or as many as you need. The second step, this is a step that everybody cries because it's when you start breaking your data layer. You need even start breaking your database. So what we want here is to first break the repository layer into that every of these package will have a uh, repository layer of their own. And you need to say which tables belong to each of these layers. That's a hard choice. And more when you have these foreign keys that will, I don't know, in the case of the customer, to get all the orders, you will have to go uh, get the customer ID, and then it will give you a lot of orders ID, and then you will need to go to the order ID table and get all the order information. And that is very easy to do with one query in SQL. But if you are separating this into two repositories, you might need to do two trips to the database and, or more. So that's something you need to start living with. And, and it's a conscious decision that you're doing in order to make this migration happen. So now you have separated your code. You have a very tidy monolith with a very tidy repository. And you know which tables belong to which package. So we will start breaking the monolith with, whoop, uh, and we will start extracting our first service. The first question is, where we start? So I have found two strategies. The first one is to start with the less critical part. That's obvious. And the second one is start with the most return on investment part. That's dangerous. So the best option is to do one, two, three, four migration, as many as you feel comfortable with strategy number one. Train yourself, do the track work, test your foundational work, get experience, get motivated, get pumped, like, yes, this is good, now I know what I'm doing. And then go and migrate that 20% of your application that has the 80% of the code. And there, everybody starts really seeing the, the, the transformation of your application and the value of the migration. One important thing I will be talking during this uh, migration is the logical microservice concept. That's a collection of functions and managed services. And this is a good abstraction because managing Lambda functions is, as I said, herding cats. It's very hard for your brain to keep track of everything that is going on. And also, you want to keep the data that has some kind of owners because if everybody is poking in the database, it becomes very out of control. So I like to have this concept of logical microservice where I define a set of uh, functions and services that can access the data. They, all these logical microservices will be kind of deployed independently from each other. They can be replaced into weeks and all those things that we talk about microservices. So maybe the functions inside this thing are not replaceable, uh, deployable independently. That's something you will need to work on, but it might not happen. Also, this logical microservice can fit very nicely into one repository where it lives with its infrastructure and you can deploy it with one line, one command line very nicely. Let's start migrating our application with the first example that is the customer microservice. And these are some of the use cases that the microservice cover. And the first one is to get the orders detail. But first, I want to mention one thing. I'm a little obsessive, and I like to do my functions that do one thing and one thing only. So that makes even life more complicated, because now you have functions for everything. So how we can make these functions work together? Well, there is two mechanisms. or Well, there are more, but there is two main mechanisms, orchestrating the functions or choreography of the functions. So let's look at orchestration. Orchestration is a big brain on top of everybody that is 
handling the puppets and telling everybody what to do. So for that, we will need to build some kind of logic that does this orchestration to handle all these lambda functions that they are doing one thing only. Here, the, the challenge is how we know, because we will get the day order from the database, and then we launch a lot of parallel functions that will execute at the same time that will get the details of the order from the order service. So now we need to have some kind of mechanisms that is, knows when all these functions finish and sends the data to one place to produce the final results. If you want to do that, very simple. There is a step functions that is a, a state machine service that you can throw the lambdas as I draw it in the diagram and say, I need this to be parallel. I want this and I want this to take all the results of the parallel executions and things will just happen. This is a great service to do parallel functions, serial functions, circuit breakers, retry logic if you're contacting some uh, external service and you don't want to build that retry logic inside your application. And if we do something like that with this service, it looks very clean and it's very nice. The service will handle the parallelism. It will handle sending the inputs and the outputs of the re all the lambdas to the right lambda. And it will generate an output that makes sense that is organized. The other way that we can or organize our lambda functions or our functions in general is to use choreography. And this is a great way for event-driven applications because it's all based events. So choreography is like we have a lot of dancers and they uh, hear the music and with the different triggers of the music or different things that are happening, they know what to do. So nobody's telling them what to do. They all know what to do. And the same happens with uh, functions or with different services. It's not a good practice when you're working with functions to make one function talk to another. Why? Because you add a lot of coupling. So if function A needs to send a message to function B, you will need to add that coupling in the service. And then if you want to replace function B, then you need to touch function A and deploy it again. So we want to avoid that as much as possible. So for that, there is many services that will help us out. We have queues. We all know queues. Message come in, messages come out. Somebody is listening to the queue. PubSub, somebody published something to a topic. A lot of different services are listening. They do something. And then we have event buses. Message come into the event bus. There is rules that will say where to direct that message to. These are all services in all the clouds. In uh, AWS, I will talk a little bit about Event Bridge that I think is a very interesting service. And I will show you the example of the adding customer in the service. So, I talk about the adding customer here. When we have uh, a user will save data of the customer, and the data will have data, like name, blah, 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 and then a photo. And then that will need to be, a uh, photo needs to convert it to some kind of thumbnail, because we don't want, if the user sent a 500 megabytes photo, we don't want to have that. And then that needs to be stored again in the database. So how it will look? In my hypothetical case, we have the user saving information into a function. When the function is done, it sends an event to event, event bridge. An event bridge will use the rules and say, oh, OK, if this is happening, then I need to send a message to this function to save some kind of metadata. And then the user, at the same time that they are uploading the name and blah, 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 they might be using another endpoint to upload an image. In general, that's how it goes with, with this kind of uh, image upload that they go through different HTTP requests. And that will upload the image to an S3 bucket that is storage. When there is a new image in this particular bucket, an event will get triggered, and that will trigger this create thumbnail lambda. That will happen automatically the moment there is a new image in that bucket. And then when the Lambda finish, it will send another message to the event bridge. And the event bridge will say, oh, this message with this information, it fits to this rule. And I will send a message to this save metadata Lambda function. In this case, is, uh, when we talk about event driven, it's very important that the functions are independent, that they can take the same message over and over again. Because it can happen that the cloud loses the message or thinks that they lost the message, and they send the message multiple times. So if we are saving something in the database, make sure that if you are sending the same save, you're not creating records like crazy, that you have some kind of logic that if the same message and the data already exist, then we are fine. 
Another thing you need to do when you are thinking about migrating that piece of component is thinking how much of that application you can replace with managed services. Because when we build these applications, maybe those services didn't exist, or we were not really thinking about it, or we are just going to the cloud for the first time. And in the cloud providers, there is many managed services that will help us to solve common issues. You are using queues. Don't use your own queues that you host. Use some queues from the cloud. You use an authentication service. Don't build it yourself. Use Cognito that will help you to do your authentication. Or even bigger, in the case you have an analytics pipeline that you have built yourself and it's hard to maintain, just use all the services combined together and build an analytics pipeline with zero line of code. This is a 15-minute talk by itself. I will not go into details. But you can think about how you can rechange your applications. It's not just lift and shift, because if you're just lifting and shifting, you are really missing the point on using the cloud. So it's very important that when you're doing your migration, you take a moment to see and educate, again, to the first part of my conversation when I told you to get education. Because it's not only about Lambda, it's about the cloud and cloud's economics and how they work. And in most cases, these things really help. For example, this pipeline is a zero code, no, no experience required, and will create uh, reports at the end, and it scales quite massive. So it's pretty powerful. I can build it without nothing, any, any analytics in two hours. So now we are in step four. Let's break the database. If you have not migrated your data to the cloud, you should do it. Well, actually, you should have done it in step number two. But uh, there are services for that that can help you. In AWS, we have multiple services for databases. That's quite normal in all the clouds. We have services for SQL databases. That's one of the things that is not really serverless. The RDS service is not a fully 100% serverless service. But if you're using Amazon Aurora, that is our own database, that it comes in Postgres and MySQL, you can have a fully serverless database. But if you want to use some of the existing engines, it will not be 100% serverless. But that's not a big deal, because the biggest problem was in when we wanted to uh, use serverless functions, for example, and connect to this database, that it was not scaling properly. And that's something if you have been using the services, you might know. Uh, luckily, it was solved already last year by adding this component in the middle that will handle all the connections. So if you have heard that RDS is not good for serverless development, try to check it again because it's something that happened last year that, that helped out quite a lot if you have a relational database on the cloud and you want to use serverless applications. Another way to break your table is just to migrate it to something that is fully serverless-minded and is like amazing, it's my, one of my favorite services, that is DynamoDB. This table, this database is a fully managed database service that will work super fast. So you can store things in the database and you will be able to get the things super fast back. No need to complex queries. But in order to do this, you really need to refactor all your application into something that is NoSQL-y. Again, one common complaint is that uh, NoSQL doesn't accept transactions. There is transaction support, so if that's your limitation, then don't worry about it, it's supported. Then we move to the last step, and that's breaking the API. And this is something I would have loved to have when I was doing my migration, because we have to go all in, and, and it was very, very painful. Because the, there is many ways to create endpoints in, in AWS and in other clouds, but the, the best one, I think, for, for, for this use case is the elastic load balancing that has this application load balancer in place. And the magic is that you can define different targeted, uh, and you can migrate 10% of your traffic to the new service and leave 90% of the traffic in the old service. Make sure that it works. I will have loved that because I have to migrate 100% of my traffic to my new brand thing, and, and I was sweating like a pig. It was not pretty. Uh, and this is really a great way just to start migrating 10% of your traffic, see that nothing breaks, move it to 20, move it to 30. It's, it's a great way for cohort people. So now I want to show you one case study to finalize this with another story. Mm. And this is the case of Comic Relief. This is a company that is from the UK. What they do is they take donations mostly during the whole year, but mostly in one day. 
They do this red nose campaign where they invite celebrities to come to the TV uh, set and they do shows like music, comedy, all kind of things. If you ever take a British Airway plane, you might have seen the, the security ad they do with these guys. And what they have, the problem is that they have, in that day, they have a peak of 350 donations per second. You don't want to miss any donation, because if you miss a donation, that people will not donate again. So you want to catch all that sense. You don't want to miss any. And that was a very big challenge. They started with a big monolith and, and a donation service that was very resilient, but was very complicated. And every year they have to kind of set it up in order to be prepared for that day. So basically, they could not have the donation going around year-round. They only have it on that day. So in 2017, one engineer started with strategy number one, migrating the least important thing on this service. So they migrate some kind of photo gallery to serverless. That was the first tipping their feet inside the water and see how warm it was, and they were very surprised with the results. They were fast, it was, everybody was so happy. So in 2018, they decided to migrate three more services. Again, not very important, but in this time, they were starting to migrate services and creating a little bit more foundation work around it because they, have, they started to think that this is, might be the right way for them to go. So they created a lot of shared code and shared libraries and started using a lot of things that they can reutilize and think uh, that they can grow the system easier. And in 2019, they did the big boom, and they migrate the donate platform to serverless. Now they were trusting that that will solve their problem. So they did strategy number two, and they migrate to the donate service. Their architecture, you can check it in that link. I will not go into the details, but it's an architecture that is extremely resilient. It doesn't lose any donation. If something fails, something else will catch it. And that's the most important thing for them how they can make sure that this event-driven card herding service will get all the things and nobody will miss anything. And they come up with this. The interesting thing is the cost. March 2015, one day a year, $84,000. Drupal and no, 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 monolith. March 2019, whole year, because now they can do it all year round, $6,400. And from that, only 92 is the serverless part. So that's pretty impressive. The good thing, they can take donations all year round. So if you want to donate something, I think they will be happy to get it. And now they can scale and they can take all the load they need. So it's a, I think it's a good example of these strategies and, and how migration can be done. So to finalize, I will not keep on uh, adding more things, but basically just remember you to make microservices. Think about microservices. Don't let your microservices scale into nice micro monoliths. Automate everything, your CI, CD, your infrastructure, anything that you can automate, automate. Reutilize everything that is in the cloud provider or in the market. Don't build it yourself. And then these are the steps. Do your foundational work, make your homework, understand why you want to do the migration. Don't go to the migration just because. And then start moving your application to the cloud if you need. Find the seams of the code, organize your data layer, and then start extracting those services, breaking the code, breaking the database, breaking the API, and then repeat from five to seven until you're happy with the results. And that's it. Uh, I don't think we will take questions, but I will stay here. So I'm happy to get anybody uh, to, towards the stage or I will be around, or my DMs are always open for questions. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Marcia. Thank you.